If you're looking to buy a stacked NBA 2K account with max badges and more, visit SportsTMB.com. He has been in the community for years and has hundreds of reviews. Click the first link in the description to get your account today. Before this video starts, if you enjoy this video, there are many more like it already on the channel with many more like it to come in the future, so subscribe. I'm trying to hit 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year, so I would really appreciate it. I upload almost daily on this channel, so if you're looking for some consistent sports talk, this is the place for it. Also, drop a like on the video, it only takes one second and it makes a massive difference. Today, I'm going to do something that I promised myself I would never do again, which is talk about a draft prospect before I see them at the NBA level. Today, I break that promise. As for why I ever swore off prospect talk, it's because I have a spotty record. See, I do have some Hall of Fame takes, such as saying that Devontae Graham and Landry Shamit would be steals in their draft. Shamit ended up making all rookie second team as the 26th pick in the draft. And Graham, though he had a rough rookie season, now looks like he has star potential for the Charlotte Hornets with how crazy good he is at shooting and playmaking, with him having been the 34th pick in the draft. Those are the good takes, but there's also a lot of bad ones that are probably worse than those are good. I've also said that I thought RJ Barrett would be better than Zion Williamson for the Bulls. I said that Kevin Knox would win Rookie of the Year in a draft that included Luka Doncic and Trey Young. And speaking of those two, I will just leave this tweet here. Yeah, this is easily the worst take of my YouTube career. But as you can see, all of my bad calls came with lottery prospects, and I was pretty dead on calling out steals of the draft, so I'm going to make it a tradition for every draft to make one pick to be a steal of the draft. Today, I want to make my pick for who I think will be the steal of the 2020 NBA draft, and that is Desmond Bain. <laughs> For those who watched the Hawks My GM series over on my second channel, I actually drafted Bane late in the first round in that series. And that was not a mistake. I did research on that draft class prior to that for a fucking My GM series. That's the kind of level of detail that I put into that series. So if that's something that interests you and you haven't checked it out yet, go do so. But Desmond Bain is someone that I feel pretty confident saying will be a steal for the same reason that I felt confident calling Landry Shamit a steal. And that reason is his primary skill is shooting the ball. When it comes to looking for steals in the draft, when you consider the value of shooting in today's league, if you're an elite level shooter and your all around game is not a liability, you're going to have some kind of place in the modern NBA. Maybe you don't end up being a star player, with that being your only elite skill, but at the end of the day, you will have a place in some way or another. So as a result, when I'm looking for a steal, I tend to look at shooters. In Desmond Bain's career at TCU, well actually, I, I do want to say something. Can we talk about how cool that name is? Desmond Bain? Like, that just sounds like a successful NBA player. But in Desmond's college career, as a whole, Desmond shot 43% from three on 4.1 attempts per game, but in his senior season, he shot 44% from three on 6.5 attempts per game. And in case you're worried about that not holding up in the NBA, he is a career 80% free throw shooter. That's an important disclaimer because some players are good shooters in college, but that does not translate to the NBA. And a good indicator of that is their free throw percentage. Lonzo Ball at UCLA shot 41% from three on five attempts per game. However, he shot 67% from the line. Chandler Hutchinson shot 36% from three on four attempts per game in college, but he shot just 73% from the free throw line. By the way, Chandler Hutchison, it'd be great if you started hitting your threes in the NBA because uh, then you'd be a pretty damn good player for the Bulls, so get on that. But with Desmond, 80% from the line isn't anything crazy, but it's good enough to be reassuring, and that is worth mentioning because Bane has kind of a weird shot. The shot itself isn't that odd when he's actually shooting it, but he holds his follow-through weird, so that can be cause for concern. But because of his free throw shooting, I am confident that he is going to be an elite shooter in the NBA. However, Bane's ability goes far beyond his shooting. When we look at Landry Shamit, I was high on him because of both of his shooting and his playmaking ability. 
However, thus far he hasn't really been able to showcase his playmaking in the NBA because he's been put in a limited role, but that's kind of to be expected. But in Bain's case, he will be able to contribute in ways outside of shooting without the team he's on having to cater to it. First of all, Bain, unlike Shamit, is fucking shredded. The guy is in fantastic shape, and as a result, he's huge. Bain is 6'6", but he is 215 pounds of muscle. Because of his size, he gets benefits on both ends of the court. He is a good finisher because of his size. There are multiple instances of him barreling to the rim. He shoots well at the rim because most players in his position in college and even in the NBA don't have his level of strength, so they just bounce off of him. He shot 70% at the basket in his junior season, and that dropped to 63% this season, which would be slightly above average in the NBA for a guard, but I think 70% is more reflective of his finishing ability. He has a very James Harden-like body. He is an inch taller and just five pounds lighter, so he has that same ability to be physical. But then on the other end of the court, he again has a Harden-like body, which means that he can defend the post well, and unlike Harden, he puts up a lot of effort on the defensive end. And then getting back to offense, he has some creating ability for himself and others. He's really not ever going to be a guy who averages eight plus assists per game or anything like that, but he's also not someone who has tunnel vision and misses obvious passes. And he also throws good passes. He averaged four assists a game this year for TCU, he does average 2.3 turnovers a game, which is not a good ratio, but from the footage I've watched, he's not one to make sloppy plays. I just think he gets stripped sometimes because of one of his weaknesses we'll talk about in a bit. So this is a player projected to go late first round to even late second round who has an NBA ready body, a lethal shot, is a solid playmaker, and plays defense. Why is he projected so low? Well, it's really two things. His ball handling and overall shot creating ability is not anything substantial. He's pretty good at those things, but he isn't standout by any means. But two, and really the more impactful reason here, is the guy is 22 years old. He is a senior, and seniors tend to get drafted later in the NBA draft. And I'm actually not going to criticize teams for this. People have been critical of teams not taking seniors in the mid to even early first round, but I get it. Look at guys like Malcolm Brogdon and Buddy Heald. Both of those dudes were drafted in the 2016 draft, and they are both older than Anthony Davis and Giannis, who were drafted in 2012 and 2013. That makes sense with basic math, but it just doesn't feel right. But with a guy like Buddy Heald, you're like, wow, this is an exciting young player to build around, and then, oh wait, four years later, he's in the middle of his fucking prime. It can be kind of underwhelming. But that being said, at a certain point in the draft, I'd say maybe mid-first round, you should be pretty happy taking a guy you know is going to be at least solid. Instead of spending three to four years trying to develop a prospect to have the level of impact of a Desmond Bain, Maybe just draft Desmond Bain. So Bain is a fantastic three-point shooter with an NBA-ready body and a pretty good all-around game. So then the question becomes, what is his NBA comparison? Well, I think his absolute peak, and the reason why the thumbnail says I think he could be a star, is Eric Gordon with an all-around game. And I'm talking peak Eric Gordon, by the way. EG at his peak is a fantastic three-point shooter both off of the catch and off of the dribble, and he can create for himself fairly consistently, not at an elite level. He can make a mid-range pull-up, get a few drives, hit a three in a man's face, things like that. But outside of those things, Eric Gordon really is not that impactful with anything other than his scoring. He's not a playmaker really at all, he is a mediocre defensive player at best, and he's also not a good rebounder. I haven't mentioned it yet, but Bane is a really good rebounder for a two guard as well. And Bane would have the extra height and length to allow him to shoot over defenders more effectively as well as be better around the rim. And Eric Gordon is a guy who averaged 20 plus points twice in his career and averaged high teens playing with James Harden. So I think given the proper chance, Bane could be a guy that averaged 20 points per game as well as like 6 rebounds and 4 to 5 assists while being efficient and being an above average defensive player with some versatility on that end. So that is Bane's ceiling to me and at the end of my video on Landry Shamit, I talked about teams that I thought could use him the most, but in Bane's case, every team can use an elite 3 and D player with creating ability. like. Literally every team should be looking at Desmond Bain. 
I'm just hoping that he ends up on the Bulls. But that is why I think Desmond Bain is going to be the steal of the 2020 NBA Draft. That is the end of this video. Please be sure to like and subscribe for more NBA content like this and cue the outro music.